Hi, my name is Ram Jabin. I am the host for this segment of Pagan Pride Day, August 2020. Uh, this segment is called Mithraism and the appropriation of Mithraism by uh, other religions, especially Islam and Christianity. I'm a local lawyer here in Vancouver, and I've been uh, doing this presentation in person through in-person uh, workshops uh, every year for the last three years. This is the third year. And uh, this year, uh, I've, it's evolved a little bit and, you know, it's gotten just a little bit more political. Uh, the message that I have been um, uh, presenting to uh, everyone that's interested. Uh, what you saw there was uh, just a, a medi meditation I was doing. Um, I uh, initiated myself to the first grade or degree of Mithraism. And uh, there are seven grades. Uh, you can see uh, some of those grades in, in this um, uh, sort of image here. Um, you can see that uh, there's the first grade is the raven and i was imagining myself as a raven on top of a hill uh, jumping off the the hill and taking flight um, and it symbolizes uh, basically giving your heart to um, the path of mithras uh, the path of mithras uh, is uh, mithras's pass path it represents love and uh, justice. And there are seven, as you can see, there are seven paths. Uh, you have uh, the raven, the nymph, Miles the soldier, Leo the lion, Perseus the Persian, uh, Heliodarmus, um, their sun runner, and then you have Pater. And these just represent uh, deeper and deeper commitment to um, self-improvement and following the footsteps of Mithras Mithras is uh, the embodiment of love and justice in the world. So um, one of the ways that he gives love is that he, um, he slayed the celestial Taurus. Now we'll get to that. Um, but he was born in darkness and he brought light. He brought the sun over to the earth. And that's why um, uh, after the initiations take place, uh, you know, in ancient times and appropriately today, uh, we have a tradition, a communion is what we do. We have, we, we in the Mithraic tradition, there's bread and there's wine. And then you just want to dim the lights. You want to have a candle, um, something like that, to um, represent that you are in darkness and you are uh, remembering uh, what Mithras has done for, um, for the earth. Now let's get into that. Let's get into the meaning behind these rituals a little bit more. Um, so the name of the presentation now is the appropriation of Mithraism. And uh, you, you have to familiarize yourself with some terminology. First is Mithra. What does that mean? Mithra was the god of covenants in, in ancient Iran. And... Um, it has no S at the end of the word Mithra. There's no pronoun for Mithra. It could be he or a she, but the embodiment um, in Roman times was a male um, was a male figure. And just for the sake of convenience, I will use the pronoun he. Um, the original did not have a pronoun and even uh, was genderless. And if we have in uh, Iranian um, culture. A lot of women named Mitra. It's actually a female name. In any case, the original uh, concept of Mitra was um, that Mitra is the steward of the earth and the earth's affairs. So uh, justice uh, was uh, was big. Um, people believed that Mitra was the god of justice, and that god and that um, it starts off with being uh, the god of covenants. So. Uh, when two nations warred, uh, you know, and this is all documented from thousands y years before BC, before Christ, uh, about 1,500 BC, they found um, artifacts and there was a pact between two nations that invoked Mitra as 
the God of the covenants, and that made their peace much more serious. Uh, it wouldn't be as serious if you didn't invoke Mitra. People then uh, believe that they there needed to be some sort of higher entity to ensure that the uh, warring nations uh, would stay in peace. And if one broke the covenant, that had very serious repercussions because they invoked Mitra. Uh, they invoked a promise under the God of Covenants. And if they broke that covenant, um, they would be uh, acting immorally and Mitra would act against or there'd be judgment against those people or nations that broke the covenant. So it's very serious. Uh, and um, we can see that how, cov how the idea of the God of covenant uh, covenants um, relates to morality and then how it relates to justice. Uh, so... Uh, you know, but originally it started as this concept of a thousand eyes in the sky. And so you can uh, imagine um, uh, that when you're doing something immoral, uh, the idea is someone is watching and it won't be unnoticed that you have broken a promise. Um, even if no human being knows about it, uh, they like the idea that it's you're still being watched and this would encourage moral behavior. Mithra also became associated with the sun because the folklore is that uh, Mithra is love as well as justice. He brings the sun to the earth uh, with the help of the raven to bring warmth to the earth and that he, he oversees life on earth and justice in all human affairs. And you can see this is again still the Iranian version. You see Mithra here, he's wearing the sun's crown because what happens is that uh, the sun doesn't want to come to the earth, but Mithras confronts the sun, and the sun is uh, essentially inspired by Mithras, uh, Mithra and um, gives him the crown, and they become united, and uh, then the sun comes. And so there is the Sunday, the word Sunday comes from a Mithraic culture originally. Handshakes are, are often thought to have begun during these times of um, warring nations and learning how to make covenants that are serious. And um, uh, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that uh, emanate from Mithraism. In this, uh, and then the kingdoms, uh, the, it, it, you can tell that the kingdoms invoke Mithraism to show to the world that, uh, and their society, that they are legitimate, they um, will be just, and they will be fair and loving. And so there are many myths that show a king. And there's myths in Ireland. There's myths from Iran. The Iranian ones are Mithraic myths because they show a king that is trying to be loving and trying to be just. And they have to go through some inner demons. They have to go through some outer demon demons. They have to defeat some um, outer demons like a dragon or even um, uh, other people that want the throne, eventually they make it to the throne and then they prove themselves to the people to be loving. They bring prosperity and they bring fairness to that land. But that can only happen if they are indeed um, sponsored and bestowed by Mithra. So they would pray to Mithra, they would invoke Mithra uh, for their own legitimacy and to create legitimacy in the eyes of the people. It's a double-edged sword, of course, because when you're going into war, um, the this culture did um, did become involved in war, and kings and kingdoms would eventually invoke Mithras to say, um, "I pray to you that you be on my side. I want to be just. I want to be the one, the good guy in the war." And so that's what you have. Um, you get now you have the more Greek, and slowly you get more Roman. Uh, versions of Mithra, and that's when I say Mithras, which is the modern version of Mithraism, developed uh, by the Greeks and the Romans. Um, in Greece, uh, this is Antiochus II, famous um, king of a province in between Persia and Greece. So the Persian Persians and the Greeks were warring a lot, and then in between Persia and Greece, there'd be a whole bunch of um, states and provinces. Um, that um, became basically a mixed culture. 
And um, this is Antiochus is a good example of that. And you'll see kings such as Mithridates, a Greek name using the word Mithra. So there were mixed cultures. And this is right before um, what we regard as the birth of Christ, before the year zero. Uh, these things were happening. There were fast developments. Mithraism was spreading into these Greek provinces. And then after they spread to the Greek provinces, they're even better received in Rome because Roman, the Romans and the Persians didn't have as much animosity as the Greeks and the Persians. So the Romans actually um, do adopt Mithra, uh, Mithras as a official deity. And before um, uh, um, Emperor Constantine, when we know that um, the state religion uh, turns more Christian, this is when Mithraism was at its strongest in Rome, and it was specifically the Roman army, but there are um, a number of emperors. Um, it was a classless um, group, and there was no class involved. You can have a soldier, a slave. Um, in, in, in the uh, Mithraeum here, where this is their church, and um, and you have emperors in there. You had a whole bunch of emperors and high-profile people that couldn't make it through the seven grades, and but they really wanted to uh, make it through the seven grades. Um, a lot of them, get, a lot of them get stuck at the fourth grade here. Uh, anyway, so what happens is that um, the Romans end up adopting it. This is the. Uh, this is the celestial Taurus and the slaying of the celestial Taurus on the coins back then. Um, and uh, you have this type of imagery here. This is the slaying of the Taurus, the sacrifice of the Taurus. And um, the, blood, the wine is the representative of the blood of that sacrifice. The bread comes from the tail of the Taurus. And life comes from the semen of the Taurus. This is an ancient myth ancient uh, folk story. Uh, there are many variations. Um, East Indians have uh, both Mithraism and they have similar stories. But their Mithraism is a little bit different. It's more of a cousin than a sort of a sister religion. Um, and so after um, you get initiated, you get initiated to one of those seven um, grades and then that's when they have their communion in the dark or a dark place to replicate um, the fact that Mithras comes from the dark and he brings light. And then this is sort of an image of that communion. You can see here that um, there are uh, two people at the table. That's the father. That's the highest grade person that is um, self-improved the most. And those seven grades are about self-improvement. Um, the first step was just committing the idea of I want to take flight. Um, and live a different life, and I want to give up material gain for spiritual gains that, that, which are provided through the path of Mithras. And each, each step uh, involve, uh, is this more serious commitment to love and justice and improving yourself, developing f uh, virtues. Self-improvement is very difficult. It takes all your, your whole life to get better and better as a human being and to learn more about yourself and how you can improve. Um, after the raven takes flight, um, it, you essentially marry this idea, and that's the bride. Then you have uh, the soldier is, is serious because the soldier is where you have to fight your inner demons and, um, and make sure that you are not following any other path but the Mithraic path. And what it really does, it, it, as, you know, as we alluded to, it, it sort of encourages people and it encourages kings to be more loving and to be more just, to bring the warmth such as the sun. And, um, but of course, um, if someone does something immoral or uh, unfair, you try not to do those things and you try to be the sun and you try to be just. Now we're talking, we said Mithra, Mithras, and now we're talking about Mithraic things. Mithraic things could be rituals, could be folklore, and a lot of Mithraism has infiltrated the, the Persian language. Um, there's a marriage agreement is named after Mithras. Um, all sorts of, um, the word uh, friendship 
is the word Mithra in in Persian. So um, there, there, it's infiltrated the language. It's continued. There are remnants of Mithraism in uh, some Iranian culture. And in um, actually, uh, the traditions have survived in some pagan cultures in Iran, which we'll get to uh, at the end about how pagan culture is being persecuted in various parts of the world. Now let's look at some resources, uh, some really fancy resources here, uh, really cool stuff, um, really good reading. Uh, you have these books that are um, really, really long, and they look at um, all sorts of historical developments, really fun stuff to read about uh, right before Christianity, how was Mithraism being um, spread throughout Europe. There's hundreds of, th close to thousands, I believe, of uh, Mithraeums all over Europe, which is where prior to the advent of Christianity, that was the most popular deity at that time, especially for the Roman army. The Roman army um, would use this um, for people. Uh, they would cut, they would use word of mouth to invite people to those Mithraeums, get them initiated, and depending, de depending on their interest and their seriousness um, in the path of justice and love to, um, to, to, move up those grades until they uh, are as close to Mitra and perfection as possible as a human can. So these are some of the books here. This is the seminal book that really kicked off things. France Cumon, The Mysteries of Mitra, and then Mithras, The Secret Guard. These two are available online. You can see their, um, their addresses here. You can't share it. You can't print it, but you can read it. Um, you, I mean, I'm sharing it here uh, with you, but you can't like email it or, or anything. So um, then, um, then you have these really, really good articles here. Um, uh, Britannica.com, excellent article, very concise, uh, and written by um, by a scholar. Um, very short though, Reinhold Mer Merkelback. Excellent, excellent article that really sums it all up. Um, and then you have this book called The Mysteries of Mithras, The Pagan Belief That Shaped the World. Excellent book if you want to self-initiate want to get, and then you want a concise history uh, because uh, those other books, the, more, uh, the other ones that I showed you are very long. Um, and they, but they are, they're, they're really cool, but they are longer. And um, this is a shorter version of those essentially that gets more to the point. Uh, now let's get into even funner stuff. Uh, let's get into some more resources, some um, some quotes such as from um, Patrick Colum, the very uh, neutral uh, person in this field, uh, a scholar, a, um, a, 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 a specializes in myths. And uh, look at the book online that he has available, Orpheus, um, The Mysteries, The Myths of the World. And so every country is seen here, not just the Persian or the Roman, but um, you get myths, the Gilgamesh myth, or um, Osiris and Isis, and uh, you can see all this stuff that um, influenced Christianity and what we regard as Christianity and Islam. Osiris and As Isis, excellent um, uh, depiction of um judgment and if you are an unjust person and an immoral person the idea that you there will be judgment um really stems from that story there um and um and then this persian story is exact example of what i was talking about the king uh, is a just king and he eventually uh, he's a he's a loving and just king he eventually makes it to become the king, and that is in itself just, and that is Mithraic story. But you get all sorts of stories. You get all the Nordic stories, Celtic stories, and you see some similarities between a lot of these cultures. You got the original sin here, Pandora. Uh, we know that prior to Christ, there was many stories about sin and the original sin, and there are stories to teach us a lesson, perhaps, or it was a creation myth to a certain extent. Pandora obviously was the box that Zeus made and because of people's curiosity and jealousy they opened that box and they opened up all the woes of the world that came out of that box and people were jealous and curious because Pandora was so beautiful and she was made by Zeus to attract um, human beings 
um, to that box, and it was a sort of revenge for Zeus to do that against the humans. Anyway, um, so this uh, this author has written um, an introduction for each culture. So there'll be an introduction for the Chinese myth. There'll be an introduction for the every single culture. There will be an introduction for that. And in the introduction that I'll reference today, um, what he says is that the Persian religion had strong influence upon both Judaism and early Christianity. And um, he's talking about Zoroastrianism because Zoroastrianism was a reformed version of Mithraism. Um, in any case, um, as he continues to talk about Zoroastrianism, he says this religion in the form of the worship of one of the angelic powers of Zoroastrian theology, Mithra, spread through the West during the late Roman Empire, made itself a powerful rival of young Christianity. Mithra was identified with the sun, had a cult that was fostered by the Roman military guild, uh, and anyway, uh, so what, what's going on here is that before Zoroastrianism, Mithra, Mithra was the strongest deity in ancient Iran. Um, this is prior to Christ. This is a thousand to uh, five hundred years prior to Christ. And then um, Zoroaster was a prophet. He reforms, um, reforms Mithraism and um, he replaces Mithra with a more mystic um, supreme being, uh, rather than being an entity in the sky that maybe Mithras was or Mithra was, he uh, changes it and says there's only one God, and that is a spiritual being that we can't um, uh, that that we can't comprehend. In any case, uh, what we can comprehend is that uh, there's good and bad, and uh, our our job is to try to you know, use those seven steps. So Zoroastrians had those seven steps uh, to become better people and to defeat evil in our life. And then that will defeat evil in the world. And that is just one step closer to the idea of a devil. There was no idea of a devil until Christians created it. But um, you can see how they used uh, Zoroastrian good and evil, ideas of good and evil as a launching point um, to create the idea of a devil. And then um, we know all those rituals, that uh, Mithraic rituals, they took those as well. And they, um, they were able to appease the Roman army, uh, uh, partly violently. They built churches over the Mithraeums and they violently took over. But at the same time, they incorporated and appropriated many Mithraic um, beliefs and rituals. And this had a great effect um, to popularize Christianity in that time. We've got another cool um, quote from D.H. Lawrence uh, from the book The Plume Serpent. Here's a fun book. It's sort of action-packed. It's uh, more of a movie than a book, uh, but uh, not as eloquent perhaps as other D.H. Lawrence books. But the, the idea is to, to resurrect um, old pagan religions. Uh, because they are more relevant, the idea is that they're more relevant to our time, and that in any case, the old, uh, the, the gods, the Christian and Islamic gods that are more abstract are um, less relevant, and, and his theory is that they all have their own time, they have their own phase, we got to move from that phase, move to a new phase, and um, D.H. Lawrence wanted to re resurrect all of these cultures, Mexican culture, as you can see, um, Druidic culture, every culture, and um, and Mithras again to return to Persia is what he is going for, and what he wants is all these cultures to be resurrected and um, to be a reemergence of all those cultures. So that's a cool book if you ever get to um, to uh, read it. Um, and uh, now, what are the themes? Let's wrap things up a little and summarize. We know that uh, the th that uh, Mithra is the is the god of justice and love, and we know that they all, Mithra also represents covenants, morality, friendship, warmth, warmth, and legitimacy. Um, we know that it, it holds people and even governments to a high standard of character and justice, just as I mentioned, such as through mythology. We through our in our culture in Iranian ancient culture, they. Um, highly value a good leader 
and uh, a, a virtuous leader that is kind, honest, and brings prosperity to the land. And so that those are Mithraic elements that we value and we see those values in our ancient myths, right? And now we're going to get slightly political. We're going to ease into the politics. Um, and first, we want to um, discuss the relevance of these things today. We know the relevance to tr strive to be good and just as a person, to self-improve, to beat our in inner, de inner demons, and, um, and uh, strive towards improvement throughout our lifespan. That is something that is perhaps in common with many spiritual movements. Um, and then we also have, what is it relevant for to about today? There's definitely a pol political element that we cannot ignore. If, um, if we are proud to be pagan, um, then we're going to definitely experience um, some persecution throughout the world, and we have to speak against such such things. So, uh, paganism uh, is the most persecuted culture in um, fundamentalist geographies, such as wherever ISIS is, and the Islamic um, govern or Islamic type of uh, fundamentalist regime in Iran, which is a government. Um, that government also is a fundamentalist government and they persecute uh, pagans. We have uh, pagans in the Yarasani that are still alive and they are Mithraic and we have the Yazidis that are uh, a mixture of, again, Mithraism and um, Islamic spirituality. But because they have the pagan element, um, they are persecuted and it's, it's extreme. So this is why it's important to, to, to um, consider uh, politicizing these things. The Iranian government burned recently a pagan alive. Uh, they they thought of it as, um, okay, pagans are fire worshippers, Iranian f pagans are fire worshippers. Well, here's some fire for you. We're going to burn you alive. Um, and that's the sort of attitude they have towards pagans. And ISIS is very similar, same sort of fundamentalism. They take Yazidi women as sex slaves in Iraq. Um, and it's very famous. It's all documented. Um, and then the other bit is that appropriation. Um, these things, all these rituals have been appropriated. We know that the Islam has taken the seven steps of Mithraism and Zoroastrianism and incorporated it and they called it Islam. Um, Christianity has appropriated the communion, the appropriate Sundays. We know that the evergreen was prior to Christ. We know that um, the cross was used, but it was equidistant cross that you see on the Anglican, Anglican Church, um, and uh, we know those things are, are pre-Christ, uh, we know the communion, um, even the very con the, the theological concepts of Christianity are very similar to the belief system of Mithraism, with the God watching over us, and um, the judgment day, all of these things emanating from um, um, Mithraism, and before Mithraism, um, we had very similar beliefs in Babylon and Egypt. So there's some cousin um, cultures in Egypt and in Babylon that even predate Mithraism. So um, they're sort of cousin cultures. Uh, and so, you know, appropriation of the culture, um, obviously, while erasing that culture, uh, could be uh, a political issue of importance today. And um, now I invite you all to... Join me for a communion um, in a striving to be better and more just. And I am also involved in mobilizing against these sort of human rights violations against pagan cultures. Uh, and uh, that is my email. I hope to hear from you.